Good evening, and thanks for watching CBS News Minnesota. I'm Frank Vassalero. And I'm Amelia Santinello. 15 years ago today, the 35W Bridge collapsed into the Mississippi River, a day most who lived in the Twin Cities at the time will never forget. 13 people were killed, 145 others were injured. WCCO was there the day it happened and followed the aftermath of the tragedy closely. Today, we're looking back on those moments and looking at the changes Minnesota has made as a result of the collapse. It happened on August 1st, 2007, just as our six o'clock news was beginning. We sent a crew to the scene right away as we tried to piece together what was happening. Our Jason DeRussia called in live during the newscast and described the heartbreaking images that he was witnessing just moments after the bridge came down. Here's part of that call. Yeah, Frank, I just got here. The scene is pretty unbelievable. I'm looking at a huge fire. It appears a tractor trailer is on fire here where this part of the bridge collapsed. Looks like the, co the bridge has collapsed uh, both uh, in the northbound and the southbound lanes, and it looks like just a total failure of the bridge. What I'm looking at is uh, kind of right at an area where the bridge would normally be held up. There's a crack, and it's like at about a 45-degree angle. We're trying to get a little closer to get a sense for exactly exactly what we have in the water. I'm trying to get a little closer to the scene. The number of uh, emergency vehicles out here is unreal as they keep uh, coming closer and trying to get an idea as to what's happening. There are still some vehicles up on the bridge. Uh, so if I can get a little closer and find out some more, I'll let you know. But right now, the scene is just uh, police, park police everywhere in thick plumes of black smoke going up into the air as this vehicle fire here on the uh, end of the bridge. One of the more frightening images from the day of the collapse was the school bus caught right in the middle of the wreckage. There were over 50 kids aboard, and thanks to the help of one man, they all made it out alive. In the middle of the disaster, 20-year-old Jeremy Hernandez emerged as a hero. There are some things kids should never have to experience. I was like so scared. Surviving this terrifying fall in a school bus made the youngest victims long for the most basic of comforts. Everybody was crying and, and for, for their mom and they want to go home. Yet in the midst of all the chaos, a calming force emerged. I'm just still shocked. I'm just still shocked that they keep saying they want Jeremy. Jeremy is the one that kicked the bus open and took the kids out. Martha Roberson's granddaughters are talking about the gym coordinator for a community center called Wait House, 20-year-old Jeremy Hernandez, who didn't hesitate to help the kids in his care. He kicked open the bus's back door and carried children to safety. I was looking like to make sure that there was no other kids running around the bus or on the bridge for it to collapse. This is one of those times when you're grateful someone's life took a turn. Jeremy always wanted to be an auto mechanic. Unable to afford school, he focused on another passion, helping kids. His help arrived not a moment too soon and taught kids a lesson they won't learn anywhere else, that a regular guy can become a hero. Oh, it's a cool guy. Some of the very first to arrive at the site of the collapse were Minneapolis firefighters. They worked quickly to pull victims from the rubble and were the reason many people made it out alive. Ten years after the collapse, we sat down with two of those brave first responders. We have lost all of the 35W bridge across the river. The first words were met with disbelief. You just hear the call about a possible bridge collapse and everybody's like, hmm, no way. <laughs> Within five minutes, firefighters from Minneapolis Station Number 11 were on scene for confirmation. That's when they came right back down saying the whole bridge is down, the whole bridge is down. And it was the very first shift Jackson Milliken worked as the captain of Rescue 9. He made the call to split up and slid down to the river bank below. There were 17 cars. 24 victims and the two of us. They went car to car, keeping their training in mind. Who's going to be okay for five minutes? Who's going to be okay for 20 minutes? It was already too late for two people. They'd eventually locate a woman eight months pregnant, still seat belted in her car. As he was getting her legs, I lifted, lifted her up through the hole in the windshield. That woman delivered her baby by C-section that day. Coincidentally, they named him before the bridge went down. I found out months later that the baby was named Jackson, so kind of a neat story. And just two years ago, another woman Milliken saved welcomed a baby girl. 
Liv Milliken Rood. <laughs> Ten years later, both firefighters believe they aren't the real heroes. They give that title to the people who weren't in any uniform. If it wasn't for them, I don't think we could have uh, just done it. But wouldn't even think to leave. Hennepin County Health Center was flooded with patients after the collapse. The trauma center helped save the lives of some of those who were critically injured that day. In 2017, we sat down with a team there to hear what the day was like from their perspective. This was on a scale that we had not witnessed before. These level one trauma docs have seen a lot, but nothing like this. Listening to radio traffic, Dr. John Hick knew it was big, so we sped taking off a nearby car side door mirror on the way. I was on scene within about 10 minutes. And that pace would continue. He quickly coordinated triage on scene. The scope of what had happened is, is just immense enough that you're like, okay, I mean, where do you start? And then you just start with what's in front of you. Dr. Bill Higard started prepping the hospital. The first few minutes for everybody were like, Wow, what is going on? They had no idea how many patients they'd be receiving in this very room. Within 30 minutes, we had our ORs up and running. We had our, all our CT scanners, and we had the capacity to you know, manage 60 patients that were critically ill if we needed it. In his 25 previous years at HCMC, Dr. Doug Brunette says this was a first. I found out that it was the 35W bridge in the middle of rush hour, and I saw what condition this person was in, and I inside I said this is going to be a really long night. 24 critically ill patients went to HCMC. Most of the injuries were to the head or blunt force trauma from falling. Some were crushed, others impaled. Everybody that arrived that um, was alive to the hospital survived. There are hundreds of people there and for our EMS crew to find the 24 that were critically ill and bring them to this room uh, within 90 minutes is uh, exception. That night felt to me like, okay, we did our job, you know, and then he went home and, and he, I didn't, it didn't really sink into me until the next days after that. What a big impact this had on the community and on the hospital as a whole. Just the fact that a bridge that you drive every day, I mean, should not just fall down. And when it did fall, they were there to help lift their city up. The rescue mission to find victims continued days after the collapse. 16 members of the U.S. Navy were called in to help. They pulled the last eight victims from the water, bringing closures to the family. Ten years after the collapse, those Navy personnel returned to the site to remember the lives that were lost. Only hours into the search for bridge victims, it was apparent. Diving amid the tangled web of wreckage would need an elite team trained in mass tragedies. I recall it was an immediate response to a request made through uh, the government of Minnesota, uh, requesting from the President of the United States. Noah Gottesman and Brian Bennett were among the 16 U.S. Navy divers assigned the job, part of the same team that pulled bodies and data recorders from the crash of TWA Flight 800 11 years earlier. We honestly didn't know what was down there until we did a survey of it. The first five victims were recovered by local dive teams, but deeper into the twisted wreckage were thought to be another eight. The collapse was a lot of sharp metal, uh, debris, concrete, rebar. As the team's underwater footage shows, water conditions were murky, muddy, and treacherous. Rebar, sharp objects, and you're crawling through you know, 20 feet of wreckage to, to get to where we needed to go. Working from an Army Corps barge, they'd cover every inch, tethered to oxygen tanks above the water to stay submerged much longer. Yet despite the sobering reality of retrieving dead bodies from the wreckage, divers say they were left with a positive feeling about their service, mostly because of the help they brought so many grieving families. We were honored to be able to come bring closure to families and taking part in something like that. A connection that brought them back to the Twin Cities recently to lay a wreath of white lilies into the river. Remembrance of the lives lost and a community still stinging with pain. Bill Hudson, WCCO, 4 News. When we come back, an inside look at the moment, the news of the collapse hit our newsroom.